Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling American Turner. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on the Diary of Lady Murasaki. Lady Murasaki is, of course, much, much more famous for her monumental masterpiece, The Tale of Genji, this wonder work of a novel uh, that is beautiful and strange and deeply realistic. It's suffused with characters, uh, and it's also a bit gossipy and satiric, and, and that's part of what makes it such a joy to spend time in. But midway through it, I found a copy of the diary, and I thought that might be an interesting window uh, into a different side of Lady Murasaki's perspective, and it certainly was. Yes, there are common pieces between both works, uh, but the diary presents sort of her own view, her own perspective uh, on her work as a creator, on her role and her existence within the, the high court, and um, sort of her view of, of her, her place within the time and, and the chronology of, of Japanese literature, Japanese uh, art, and uh, the art and literature created by Japanese women. And so there, this was a really interesting window into the mind that is behind the tale of Genji. Uh, and there are even passages where she talks about someone referring to her as the writer and, and how that affected her life at court. So it's it's a very short read, but it's interesting. Now, it does have the wonderful language Murasaki is capable of. It opens, as autumn advances, the Tsuchi Mikado mansion looks unutterably beautiful. Every branch on every tree by the lake and each tuft of grass on the banks of the stream takes on its own particular color, which is then intensified by the evening light. The voices and ceaseless recitation of sutras are all the more impressive as they continue throughout the night. In the low, slowly cooling breeze, it is difficult to distinguish them from the endless murmur of the stream. And that paragraph could uh, absolutely exist within the tale of Genji. She moves on. Her majesty listens to her ladies-in-waiting engaged in idle gossip. She must be in some distress, but manages to hide her feelings as if nothing were amiss. Perhaps this calls for no comment, and yet it is quite extraordinary how she can cause a change of heart in someone so disenchanted with life as myself and make me quite forget my troubles. If only I had sought solace for my unhappiness by taking service with her much earlier. It is still the depth of night. The moon has clouded over, darkening the shadows under the trees. There come voices. Can we open the shutters? But the servants will not be ready yet. Attendant, open up! Then the bell for the dawn watch suddenly wakes everyone up, and the ritual of the five great mystic kings begins. Uh, and, and, and so we have this beautiful scene-setting opening within the diary. Uh, and it, it has many passages like that. But it also wanders into different aspects of, of uh, Lady Murasaki's life there at the court. We see her recount moments where she's trying to support her brother in his rise through the uh, court ranks and, and the, the civil service there, and the ways in which he's a disappointment and failure. In that second paragraph there, there was a moment of sort of psychology that's involved, and that does exist across uh, the work. Lady Murasaki and, and her, her colleagues and peers and fellow comrades at the court, they have these moments of interchanges where they will alternately mock and support each other, where they'll see uh, moments that, that make them question what they've been valuing, what they, what they care about. And so to see all of that sort of behind the curtain of what's happening as she crafts the tale of Genji is really fascinating. There are also moments <coughs> where we get the witty banter of poetry. <laughs> His Excellency happened to see that Her Majesty had the tale of Genji with her. Out came the usual comments, and then on a piece of paper that held some plums, he wrote, She is known for her tartness, so I am sure that no one seeing her could pass without a taste. And he handed it to me. She is a fruit that no one has yet tasted. Who then can smack his lips and talk of tartness? I am shocked, I replied. One night, as I lay asleep in a room in the corridor, there came the sound of someone tapping at the door. I was so frightened that I kept quiet for the rest of the night. Early the next morning, I received... Crying, crying all night long, more constant than the water rail. In vain did I tap at your door. To which I replied, The water rail was indeed insistent, but had I opened up, come, come dawn, I may well have had bitter regrets. <laughs> and so there, there, there is that uh, wonderful sense of, of wit and, and the way that poetry would be used just in conversation, that it was, it was a way of life, it was a way of discussion that feels artificial at times and yet could not have been more real for the individuals uh, in, living in that moment. And the way that they would um, remember these poems or, or note them down in their diaries and keep them, uh, there, there, there is this special sense of what that type of banter would have felt like. Um, but th there are numerous times where characters are less than pleasant with each other. <laughs> In one, um, Lady Sakyo seems to be very much at home with the ladies of the first consort, said advisor Kanetaka, revealing that he knew her of old. 
Junior Captain Masamichi also remembered her. That was Lady Sakio the other night, sitting on the east side among the attendants, he said. Somehow all this came to the ears of Her Majesty's ladies, who thought it most interesting. Well, we can hardly just ignore it, they said. Fancy someone who used to lord it in the palace, returning in such a manner. She must be trying to remain incognito. We must disillusion her. And with that in mind, they chose from the many fans in Her Majesty's collection, one with a colored painting of Mount Horai. They did it deliberately, but did they realize what it was meant to signify? And they send this as a gift with a comb to the woman, uh, with the idea that that mountain is a specific symbol of longevity. And so this reminder to that lady who has returned to court after a long absence, she's not getting any younger. <laughs> and so, that exists across the, the many pages here. We have these moments where we see these little interchanges, these little digs uh, that could not be closer to the way that we see what's, hap that what's happening across the novel in the tale of Genji, that we're constantly sort of peering in, peeking around the corner, peeking through you know, the slats and the openings to be able to see into a room that we're not really welcome into, that we're not necessarily privy into. Just as the tale of Genji is this picture of court life and this, this romance and this adventure uh, that we necessarily uh, would never have been allowed to actually interact within, uh, and that, that Lady Murasaki herself wouldn't necessarily be able to, to share openly at court. Here we were privy to these inner thoughts, these hidden thoughts, uh, the, the way that the uh, individuals talk around each other. As Lady Murasaki herself writes, now if I go on describing people for you in this manner, I am sure I will get a reputation for being a gossip, especially if it concerns those close to me. It is too difficult to discuss people I meet every day, and I should avoid commenting on anyone about whom I have second thoughts. <laughs> so that's a, uh, that she then goes on to describe uh, nine different women she's met at court. <laughs> I guess there were no second thoughts on those. And so it, it really is a work that is unique and, and interesting. She talks about the way that others write. She talks about the court rituals and the religious rituals, um, the, the differences that exist between practicing Buddhism there uh, in the 11th century and uh, Shinto are evident on these pages in, in interesting and unique ways. They recall to mind some of the reading I did in the flower ornament scripture uh, earlier this summer. But perhaps one of the... Uh, most enjoyable. The wife of the governor of Tamba is known to everyone in the service of Her Majesty and His Excellency as Masahira Imon. She may not be a genius, but she has great poise and does not feel that she has to compose a poem on everything she sees merely because she is a poet. From what I have seen, her work is most accomplished, even her occasional verse. People who think so much of themselves that they will, at the drop of a hat, compose lame verses that only just hang together or produce the most pretentious compositions imaginable are quite odious and rather pathetic. wonder who else she might think this about. Se Shonagon, for instance, was dreadfully conceited, the famous author of The Pillow Book. She thought herself so clever and littered her writings with Chinese characters, but if you examine them closely, they left a great deal to be desired. Those who think of themselves as being superior to everyone else in this way will inevitably suffer and come to a bad end, and people who have become so precious that they go out of their way to try and be sensitive in the most unpromising situations, trying to capture every moment of interest, however slight, are bound to look ridiculous and superficial. How can the future turn out well for them? Thus do I criticize others from various angles, but here is one who has survived this far without having achieved anything of note. I have nothing in particular to look forward to in the future that might afford me the slightest consolation, but I am not the kind of person to abandon herself completely to despair, and yet, by the same token, I cannot rid myself entirely of such feelings. On autumn evenings, which positively encourage nostalgia, when I go out to sit on the veranda and gaze, I seem to be always conjuring up visions of the past. And of course, she conjured up within that <laughs> the tale of Genji. Uh, and so this diary was, was, it was a very interesting window into her mind, uh, into her culture. And it was certainly one that I think amplifies what I'm finding in the tale of Genji, what I'm enjoying about the tale of Genji. There is another common similarity of the way that both in the diary and in Genji, Murasaki refers to so many individuals by their rank, by their court rank within the civil service, even her own brother. She won't necessarily met, say, oh, I sent this person for my brother. She'll say, I sent this person for the minister of war ceremonies, you know, like whatever his title is at the time. And so that is an interesting uh, aspect as well that we see. A work that it certainly reminded me of, of course, was As I Crossed a Bridge of Dreams, also known as the uh, Sarshina Diary. I read this in July, and uh, this was a work written a little bit later on uh, under the deep influence of Lady Murasaki within the high end court, 
and as um, the writer of this diary was someone who was reading the tale of Genji. And so to be able to kind of enjoy and see these across this generation of women at the court was really fascinating and interesting. So I'm really enjoying the tale of Genji. I'm reading it with uh, Noah from Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse and Quentin uh, from Idiot Reads and Rambles. So I, I'm really just enjoying that, but this was a fun window to uh, jump into. And I look forward to finishing the tale of Genji and sharing many more thoughts on that. Hope everybody's doing well. Thanks.